Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode of Prime News, I want to remind you to enter our Animal Crossing New Horizons giveaway. To enter it, you all you need to do is like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon to enable all notifications for this channel. The winner will be announced on March 19th. You may enter for as many times as we release videos between now and then. Uh, so yeah, literally every video, like and leave a comment. Obviously, make sure you're subscribed and hit that bell icon. It'll be a digital copy. It'll be a North American version. But since the Switch is region-free, that means the giveaway is open worldwide, obviously subject to the rules of your local country, such as age limits or even some countries that don't even allow giveaways. So uh, pay attention to that. Otherwise, uh, let's get into the video. <laughs> Hey everyone, our first story today is actually about Prinny 1 and 2. Have you never heard of them? Because I didn't hear about them until now. They were games that came out, I believe, on the PSP. If I remember right, it is a spinoff of, and I'm going to butcher this, the Desagia series. I've always butchered that name, so I apologize. Uh, the first one came out in 2008. The second one came out in 2011. They were regarded as brutally hard platformers. Uh, the official name, I'm, I'm just glancing at the notes here, says uh, they're called Prinny 1.2 Exploded and Reloaded, supposedly releasing this fall on Switch. Uh, there will be a collector's edition. It's being released by NIS America, so that's not a surprise. that They like to do their collector's editions. Uh, there will be supposedly additional content, and that's pretty much it. We don't really know much else besides that. There's a little bit of gameplay uh, from the announcement trailer, but yeah, it's a uh, it, it's a thing that's happening. So for those that look, you know, enjoyed those games in the past, that's a, a new announcement for you today. So enjoy. A new Trials of Mana trailer has dropped, and it is long, it is lengthy, and you are watching it right now. Uh, three plus minutes in length shows a lot of different things from the game. And Trials of Mana is actually a direct sequel to Secret of Mana, and came out back in the 90s, but only in Japan. And more recently came out in the collection of Mana, the original version of the game, back in June of 2019 on Nintendo Switch and other platforms. So, uh, yeah, we do now officially have it in the West, the original. And those that have played it and played it back in the day and even played it last year have regarded that, that hey, this is the third, you know, game in the Mana trilogy. And it is actually better than Secret of Mana, which is well regarded in the West and actually my second favorite game of all time. Yes, Secret of Mana is that big of a deal to me. Now, obviously, I did not enjoy the Secret of Mana remake because I feel like they butchered the art style. But in watching this one, this feels like a, a, a much better remake uh the visuals look way better the combat looks everything about it just looks better uh, and looks like a modernization of the original game so that's brilliant to me uh there's even something to be said here about some people that are really really hyped for final fantasy 7 which looks amazing and there's a demo out for that for those that haven't tried it yet on playstation 4 uh but you know that's releasing in parts whereas this remake is the entire game at once obviously we're talking about two completely different types of remakes so it's almost unfair to compare outside of the fact that they both come from square and i think what's really cool about this trials of mana remake is it shows that square is maybe testing the waters to see how popular the mana series is between the secret of mana remake this one obviously the mana collection you have to wonder if the sales are going really well will they bring the mana series back uh to me i always felt like the mana series was actually the superior franchise to final fantasy i know that's Sounds like blasphemy, but uh, personal opinions aside here. So, uh, or I guess not aside, that is a personal opinion, isn't it? Man, my English is bad today. Whatever. Uh, so yeah, Trials of Mana looking really, really snazzy. So uh, let's move on to the next story. The American Psychological Association has reaffirmed in its scientific research uh, that attributing violent to violence to video games uh, is not actually scientifically sound and that shouldn't really be surprising um there's a lot of research out there that supports this but we obviously know the media uh politicians and everything for decades now have tried to pin violence onto video games and specifically when it comes to the mass shootings uh and the whole reason this even came back up is because they updated their research by saying that that violent video games or video games in general can increase certain behaviors such as raising your voice or light pushing. Now we know this as gamers because if you ever play an online game, you can hear a lot of cussing, you can hear a lot of swearing, you can hear a lot of uh, you know yelling and screaming. Uh, and obviously, you know, we see videos online where there's some some pushing of, of friends or whatever uh, while you're playing video games. And so that I mean I think is just well accepted and known. But it, it's a it's a big leap to go from 
that to I want to shoot up a school or from that to I'm going to run a bunch of people over. Like in Grand Theft Auto, you can you know, run people over cars. Oh, no, I want to suddenly go do that in real life. It's a really big leap to go from a virtual thing to wanting to do this in reality. Now, uh, they note that the reason they want to uh, reaffirm that uh, violence does not cause video, you know, that violence is not caused by video games uh, is because they want politicians and media and actual researchers to focus on the things that are actually causing violent behavior in people, such as mental health. Uh, video games you know, can affect you in certain ways, but the people that might be more tending towards mass shootings and stuff tend to all have mental issues and were not dealt with growing up properly, uh, maybe due to cut in funding or whatever the case may be. Maybe parents didn't recognize the signs. Uh, it's one of those things where uh, they just want people to know that, hey, look, just because we updated and said there are certain behaviors that are increased by playing video games, none of that is violence at the traditional level none of that is mass shootings or killing of others and they don't want people to be distracted by this update so kudos to them for even saying anything because obviously the media and everything would run run with this update from a huge association uh, that's done extensive scientific research on it and just you know hey look there's proof see it starts it, it gets violent behavior going it gets people yelling and, and more agitated and so does like really bad days at work and and you know rude people and when you're driving cars there's a lot of road rage and like what's the root cause of all of it it's not violent video games so uh yeah that's that that's really it um kudos to the american psychological association for uh, pointing this out and keep trying to, to keep trying to get the conversation to stop these things going in the right direction so the esa might be forced to close E3 2020 or cancel E3 2020 this year. Now, uh, we know that E3 2020 was actually talked about potentially being closed before, but the ESA came out and said, hey, look, we're not canceling it. And this is due to the breakout of COVID-19, better known as the coronavirus. The reason we're talking about it today is because LA has declared a state of emergency over the coronavirus after somebody passed away from the virus sadly on a cruise ship in california and it's not just that there have been other confirmed um, deaths uh the the outbreak is spreading in california and in washington state particularly in the seattle area uh and there's a lot of concern now that this is going to become a rapidly growing epidemic uh because it that's how, kind of how it started in china it was a small amount of people and then it just blew up uh so now we could be seeing one or two new centers in the united states uh rapidly spreading this this virus so uh that obviously has prompted uh, the esa to have to release yet another statement about e3 and here's what they said the health and safety of our attendees exhibitors partners and staff is our top priority. While the ESA continues to plan for a safe and successful E3 show from June 9th through the 11th, 2020, we are monitoring and evaluating the situation daily. Our E3 team and partners continue to monitor COVID-19 via the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and the World Health Organization, also known as WHO. We are actively assessing the latest information and will continue to develop measures to further reduce health risks at the show. Again, please know that we will continue to evaluate new developments and provide updates as needed. What this reads as is obviously the ESA does not want to cancel E3. Uh, we know that E3 has been um, going through a transition, going through a change. I mean, at bare minimum, E3 has become less relevant uh, and been going through changes to try to maintain relevancy. And what would be a big blow to the ESA would be if they had to cancel E3 altogether. And this is why I believe they're going to do everything humanly possible to try to not uh, do that to not cancel. Um, I could see them doing things like handing out hand you know, you know hand sanitizer packets or, or, or little things to every attendee uh, when you enter every single day of, of the show. Uh, to having hand sanitizations all over the show floor and at every entrance and exit. Um, to, you know maybe even having masks and stuff like this. I could see them going every measure humanly possible that they could do to keep the show going because the the worry for the ESA has to be if E3 is canceled. And all these companies uh, decide to just do their own thing. Uh, Microsoft could still do their own thing without the involvement of ESA. In fact, they pretty much do during E3 because they do everything in the Microsoft theater. So they could still do that even without the ESA around. Um, you know, Nintendo can still release their digital event without E3. Yeah, they went through that show floor presence, and that would suck, but uh, they could still do the digital event, still do that Nintendo Direct-style presentation, still build a lot of hype for their games. 
Uh, and they can still bring game demos to other events, like they've already, you know, the, the, the first Animal Crossing demo actually came out at PAX, not at E3, uh, which obviously that would make a lot of sense. Oh, E3 last year would have been nice to play Animal Crossing. Whatever, it doesn't matter, that's in the past. The point is that uh, the ESA could be in big trouble uh, if E3 gets canceled, um, not just because it's their biggest money maker of the year, but because it could put the future of E3 in massive doubts. There's already some contract issues with the LA Convention Center and how maybe they won't be continuing to host it there. They might be hosting it somewhere else in a different city somewhere. Uh, and that could complicate things because a lot of major uh, Western AAA studios are located there. But it also costs millions and millions of dollars for these studios to have booths at E3, hence why the ESA makes so much money. And honestly, we're at this point now uh, where E3's relevancy is in doubt, and now uh, if the coronavirus forces them to have to, like absolutely have to shut it down, um, I think these other companies are going to realize that they don't need E3. All they have to do is release trailers online, do digital events like Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft do, and they might see the sales of their games are just the same as when they did E3. Uh, so that can make E3 extremely, extremely irrelevant. And then you have to wonder, what does E3 become if it continues in the future? Although E3 could shift focus to be more about indie games or this and that. But it's going to be difficult, I think, for the ESA and E3 to recover if there is no E3 at all this year. Uh, but again, you know, obviously health is the number one concern here. We don't want a bunch of people traveling to E3 to get sick. Uh, I am debating myself. Um, I was already wondering if I should go to E3, but Nintendo for sure is going to be there. So then, I, you know, me and my fiance were going to go and, and do coverage. But I don't know. I mean, is it worth the risk if LA is becoming a center uh, for the, the coronavirus? Is it worth the risk to go there? That is something that I'm not so sure about right now. We'll have to see how things develop. I think I have until the middle of April to make that decision because uh, that's when they close off being able to buy gamer passes and stuff. So I don't know. You guys let me know uh, what you think. If you think it's even worth going to E3. Do you think E3 is um, dying out? Um, do you think uh, do you think the, 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 the days of E3 mattering are now done? That's what, that's what I really want to know. And if it's canceled this year, is that the death of E3? Uh, let's move into our final story, and this is kind of a cool one, although, I don't know, there's been some weird reactions lately. So, the Wonderful 101's Kickstarter has crossed $2 million and over 30,000 backers. Uh, that has unlocked Lucas' second mission, which is additional content they're going to make for the game. It doesn't look like they're going to hit in, in the, the two other stretch goals they have, which is like an orchestrated track. Um, and then, you know, extra languages for the game or whatever. Uh, but what's interesting uh, about this entire Kickstarter is it was actually announced a few days ago that they didn't need the Kickstarter. Um, this is kind of a Shenmue 3 situation where the Kickstarter existed to gauge interest in the game rather than because they needed money. In fact, they had plenty of money from Tencent uh, and internally to do it. Now, they do claim they needed the Kickstarter to self-publish the game and this and that. And maybe there's something with Nintendo where Nintendo wanted to see a certain level of financial backing or a certain level of fan interest uh, in order for them to be cool with it being published on all these other platforms. And no... Um, they are refusing to talk about the business dealings with Nintendo on this, which is pretty traditional for Japan. Uh, they just say, you know, this is thanks to Nintendo we're able to do this. Uh, whether Nintendo's just giving permission for the game to be on other platforms, whether they're collecting a fee uh, on every on every copy sold, uh, whether or not uh, you know they they you know maybe Platinum Games owns all the rights to Wonderful 101. Nobody really knows, and no one's going to know because these are Japanese companies, and that's just how they operate. They don't tell people these are business dealings they keep it behind the scenes but uh there are some fans that are a little upset or feel a little bit misled uh because kickstarter as a platform uh advertises itself as a as a you know, like a, a platform that needs uh fan support or needs funding for projects in order for them to exist this is this is just the general premise of kickstarter is you go to kickstarter with a, maybe a prototype of something but you also are trying to get backing to make that something a reality. Whereas, Wonderful 101 Remaster could have happened without that Kickstarter and that funding isn't making the game happen. Now, the, the money is going to be put towards the game. They are going to use it to develop the additional content uh, and, and to fulfill all of the, the backer rewards. They have some pretty crazy backer rewards, like a vinyl soundtrack and some other crazy stuff they're doing, including if you back at the highest level, which I think is like $9,000 or $10,000, you can get a, uh, like a studio tour of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it includes your flight plus hotel, so that just 
you know, something to consider. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's it's kind of interesting that the Shemu three did. People don't seem to be as upset, but there are some people that are like, eh, you know, did I really need to put my money towards this when they clearly don't need it? Um, in my opinion, what they have done with this Kickstarter is create a lot of hype. Um, instead of doing expensive advertising campaigns and commercials and going to E3 and doing all this stuff, instead, um, they created a Kickstarter that drove hype on its own at all these various video game websites and social media. They basically used Kickstarter like Shenmue 3 to make this thing into a bigger deal than the Wonderful 101 ever has been in the past. Uh, so in that sense, it was a successful media campaign, and it gets people to pre-order the game. So, you know, they got, what, 30,000 pre-orders or something like that? It's crazy. Um, beyond all that, they are doing a celebration because tomorrow, I believe about 24 hours after this video airs, uh, they will be done. You, you can't do the Kickstarter anymore. It doesn't mean you can't get copies of the game when it releases, uh, but they are done. And uh, they are doing a celebration stream at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, tomorrow. Uh, and it will be a stream of the wonderful one. One, the wonderful 101 remastered, uh, which should let you know that obviously uh, they didn't need our money to make the game because they're already making the game or they're already porting the game or whatever they're, what, however they're remastering the game or HDifying it or, or upping the resolution or improving the visuals, the frame, whatever they're doing, they didn't need the money to do that. Hence, they're able to show off some of the game with a celebration stream tomorrow. Uh, so either way, I'm just excited that this game's coming. I don't care that it's going multi-platform. I don't care if all games go multi-platform. The more people that get to play the games, the better. Uh, so yeah, kind of cool. Anyways, that's going to do it for today's episode of Prime News. And you might be like, today's episode? But you haven't had a Prime News in forever. It's been like over a week. It happens. Um, there's been a lot of debates with this show, and I obviously want to throw the conversation out to you guys. Where do, what do you guys want to see happen with the future of Prime News? I like this sit-down format. I like this background. Um, you know, I could put some more things on the table and jazz it up sometimes, do some some fancier editing. Uh, but honestly, I, I really want to know what you guys think of this format. Uh, I really enjoy Prime News. I like, a sh I like a show that focuses more on the news, less on the opinions, uh, brings a bunch of stories together. Uh, and just talks about him a little bit. Uh, I'm very, very uh, interested in this concept of a show. I know there are other channels, <coughs> Spawn Wave, uh, that does a similar concept show in News Wave, uh, and I want to know how I can differentiate from that a little bit. The sit-down format, I think, helps a little bit, but um, I, I honestly uh, just enjoy doing it. So if you guys have any ideas, uh, let me know. Otherwise, uh, I am Nathaniel Robinson from The Turner Prime. Like the video, leave a comment, uh, like, you know, subscribe, hit the bell icon. That also gets you an entry into the Animal Crossing New Horizons giveaway. Otherwise, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm out of here. Oh, there was a request. Someone wanted the return of dance moves. I'm sitting down, so a little more difficult to dance, but uh, let's give it a shot. Yeah.